Greetings. <laughs> Should I put a little more growl into it? <laughs> okay, I came yeah. back to, we spent 48 hours making puppets. <laughs> <laughs> making and breaking hearts, Ellinger. It's not that kind of podcast. On a practical level, <laughs> I have to remember what I was saying on a practical level. We should have a safe word. <laughs> Armageddon! I guess we're maybe semi-proud of that. Welcome to Hide and Create, your online writing workshop. Welcome to another episode of Hide and Create. Uh, I'm here with Dana Roland, Joshua Esso, Moses Siragar, and today's episode is going to be about influences. Uh, who has influenced us in our careers? Um, what should you look for in an influence? How to even recognize somebody who's influenced you and how to be influential to the next generation of authors. So um, with that, I, I thought we'd just start in talking about our own influences. So Moses, uh, who do you feel has influenced you as a writer? So, you know, I, I think that George R. R. Martin is actually one of my strongest um, literary influences. And, um, you know, the thing was, I... Somehow, I was hanging out at a Barnes and Noble back when we actually had a Barnes and Noble uh, in in my town. It has closed and rest in peace. But um, somehow, I, I picked up uh, a Game of Thrones off a, off a, a bookshelf over there, and I actually hadn't read fantasy stuff in quite a long time. I used to read a lot when I was a teenager, and then I picked up this book, and I, I, maybe maybe they had it sitting on the on the you know the side or something you know where it was prominent. But um, but that became. A big influence on my my writing now because I, I became aware of a that that was a successful book, but I think even more than that, just that that was my reintroduction to the genre, you know, and uh, and I picked up from that the way he wrote in multiple points of view, and which I remembered a little bit from some things I'd read, you know, when I was younger, um, and also the some of the some of the brutal element of it too, and some of the the kind of tragic element of it as well. Um, and you know maybe that was a bad influence. You know maybe I shouldn't have picked up George R. R. Martin because I've heard uh, Robert, I'm sorry, uh, Pat Rothfuss talk about on one of his uh, sort of podcast type of shows where uh, he's like, you know, I see these new writers and they they come in and they start writing and uh, you know they want to try to write in multiple points of view and like yeah, George R. R. Martin did it, but George R. R. Martin is an amazing writer. It's not easy to it's it's harder to do that. It's a more challenging thing to do. And, you know, you look at Pat Rothfuss, he's telling, I think part of his genius is that he tells a story in the way that makes it the easiest to read, which is this kind of first person type narrative here, here's my sort of, you know, coming of age story. Um, it's, 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 not, it's not the most challenging, it's challenging in the sense it's big. You know, but he, he's not challenging you. Like, it's not hard. It's not supposed to be hard to get into the name of the wind. Like, you're supposed to just kind of warm up to that character. He's a cool character. You get in there, and then you go, which is much easier for readers when they've got that single character to identify with. And I did start, when I write multiple points of view, I did start with something that is more challenging. You know, and maybe I should have waited on that um, till I had more experience as a writer. Uh, then again, I really liked that format, and I really liked the challenge. I like trying to do it well, and, you know, hopefully, hopefully I am doing it well. Um, but that was a really strong influence on me, and uh, you know I, I think about that a lot of times. You know, what if I picked up the Name of the Wind as the first book that I'd read when I got back into the the genre, and what would that have done? Um, so it's interesting, you know, how those influences shape us because in this case, it's definitely something that has shaped me. Yeah, I hate it how sometimes <laughs> you just start in the you're really excited by masterpieces, right? So that's what you start to write, right? It, it would be like somebody instead of buying a starter home immediately buying a mansion and and people did that in the United States and that's why there was a huge housing crisis right <laughs> so I, you know and in any case um Joshua who who do you feel were your influences in becoming an editor in becoming an editor i mean it's it's harder to say because there hasn't been any really big influencing influencer for me in editing actually, actually it was me it was it was Moses. Moses was my yeah. big influencer. <laughs> I had uh, heard of Moses for many years, and uh, I really, really admired his hair. In fact, I, I soon after I met him, I grew hair like his, uh, hoping that people would confuse me for him. I'm I'm half I'm half serious because Joshua was we he and I were like beta readers for each other, and yeah. I really liked his his feedback. And I was like, can I just pay you to do this? And he was like, okay, sure. <laughs> and so, then I was like. 
oh, maybe I should do this more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you are an instigator. <laughs> uh, I mean, for... I don't know. I've read a bunch of different authors in preparing and in, in, in my continuing preparation for editing, and I've attended a bunch of workshops and seminars and spoken to well-established editors and authors. But, you know, like I said, there wasn't really a big influencer to start editing. That um, Though I like editing, and sometimes I really love editing, and I do recognize the fact that this is one of the best jobs for me personally out there. Uh, it is a job. You know, it's not uh, it's not terribly uh, creative, really. I mean, I guess it I guess that's not right. I guess it is very creative, but just in a completely different way than the rest of you. Um, I can tell you that one of my most formative um, moments for writing was uh, when I was five or six. I snuck into my parents' bedroom and I turned on the movie channel because they wouldn't let me watch it. <laughs> I think it was like HBO or something like that. Wow, took a one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's not what I found. <laughs> okay. okay. What I found was uh, a really tense scene of a, of a young woman being stalked late at night in her house. And it ended with a very graphic decapitation. And with me running to my parents very, very upset, you know, uh, regardless of, oh, I would, you know, be in trouble for having, you know, snuck in and turned the, the movies on anyways. But that was very, very upsetting. I had nightmares about that for a long time. Um, but I think it directly led me to a fascination with scary things. And when I was seven, you know, just like a year, year and a half later, I pulled down Pet Cemetery. Uh, off of one of my dad's bookshelves because I've been intrigued with the cover. You know, it's got a big, liony looking cat superimposed on um, on ground with a red horizon and a grave marker and a the bent silhouette of a boy. And that was all very intriguing and and, and scary to me. So I just kind of took it and I, I flipped through it. And spoiler alert: the first thing that I read was uh, where the father is burying his boy. And that, you know, that was kind of creepy. And so I flipped forward a little bit more trying to figure out if I really wanted to read this. And I read a slice uh, uh, of the action when Gage is like just going to town on on people. So now I, now I put the book down and I did not. I was so creeped out that I didn't finish reading that book until I was in my 20s. But that's where my love of zombies came from. And that's why like the first book that I'm writing and many of the short stories that I've written are all zombie related <laughs> Diana you could probably you can probably relate to that Diana do, how did you get your writing influences um well I have kind of you know the cheater answer is my influences are everyone I've ever read oh, that's, um, that's such a cheater that answer yeah, I, 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 <laughs> no my biggest influence uh, would have to be Anne McCaffrey uh, I love the dragon books I grew up on the dragon books the dragon books saved my life and can I just say ditto mm-hmm. to that yeah no, I mean the the her the dragon series uh, got me out of a very dark time in adolescence, and uh, I mean I read those books over and over and over. I've read the covers off of them. Uh, you know, I I used to to get through some of those very dark times by you know wishing my dragon would come and get me <laughs> kind of thing. And uh, but the big thing is it's their big sweeping stories with lots of awesome characters and characters that I wanted to be around you know I wanted to be part of these characters lives I, I, I devoured every single book that came out uh, like I said read them over and over and over I, I, I had stuff memorized my best friend in high school that's how we met is we both were fans of the dragon books uh, so there's always a very very special place in my heart for those books um, but yeah I think those those were our biggest influence because uh, what, what Anne did with those those stories um, it's uh, science fiction slash fantasy uh, thing, um, but it's also adventure, romance, thriller, mystery. It's, it's all of that, and I think that's uh, it's just amazing that she was able to create this incredible world. And it, it makes me a little sad that the kids coming up nowadays aren't reading that. They're, they're not as many people are reading those books really? uh, yeah, because there those. are there are there are other stories. Uh, you know, there's George Martin and, and there's Pat Rothfuss and all that who are wonderful, but. Uh, you know, back in my day, uh, which was a long time ago, uh, uh, that, that was the the big thing. And uh, so, yeah, that that has definitely influenced me a great deal. Yeah, it's funny because I, I think that I've heard those books described as romance with dragons, right? It, I wouldn't. It, I wouldn't say if that. You look at I, I, there was. There was romance, but no, geez, I wouldn't say that they were romance with dragons at all. Yeah, it's, you know, that whole girl cootie thing. I mean, <laughs> discussing that well, earlier. The highlight is uh, on the interaction between the characters rather than on the, the action, right? Right. I don't think there's a single yeah. 
sex scene. I mean, you know, the sex scenes are like fake oh, there black, is. basically. Yeah, there is. It, well, it's, it's very... Dot. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you're right. In that one, okay. Uh, but basically, most of them, uh, you know, the first, you know, six or seven books or so, it was a uh, very vague. In fact, I mean, I started reading them in fifth grade, and I really, I didn't get it um, what the writers of the Dream, Green Dragons were doing um, until many years later. <laughs> <laughs> totally oblivious to what um, they were doing. So <laughs> they're they're playing cards. Yeah, yeah, they're playing cards. <laughs> but, uh, in terms of my influences, you know, I'm gonna. I am the show's tie-in writer, and so I'm going to list a tie-in franchise as a an influence. Um, D- Dungeons and Dragons was a huge influence on me. Uh, not just you know the books like uh, the Dragonland series by Tracy Hickman and uh, Margaret Weiss, and um, Weiss. Sorry, I mean, you know I've <laughs> only ever seen it. I've only ever read it. I've never pronounced it. And you're Canadian. Thank you. <laughs> 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 And uh, the Forgotten Realms, just innumerable Forgotten Realms novels, um, were were a huge influence. But playing Dungeons and Dragons was specifically a fairly fairly large influence, and that's something that I had to break because, like, almost every other Dungeons and Dragons player, when I first uh, started my writing career, I would write stories about an elf, a dwarf, a warrior, and a cleric, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they all involved dragons because that's half of Dungeons and Dragons right there, right? So, <laughs> you know, like it would it basically I'd be writing fan fiction of my gaming campaigns. Um, so I, I really had to break that. And one of the ways I broke that was I went out and I read all of, you know, classical and, and modern fiction that was considered to be quite good by, you know, the majority. You know, like China... Mayville? Mayville? Mayville. 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 Thank you. Um, you know, I, I read The Scar by him. Um, I read Heinlein, too. Um, you know, and so on, right? I really, Scott Lynch, I went out of my way to, to read kind of influential authors. I did read John Scalzi. Um, so I guess they, they maybe all could have been influences on me. John Scalzi, that book, that that guy knows how to write dialogue, right? You know, like that's some of the best dialogue I've I've ever read, you know, and the the book in my opinion isn't isn't perfect, but it's it's pretty darn good and you know, so I took that away from him. Um China is just god the prose is just delicious. It's so it's cheesecake, right? So you know, uh mm-hmm. Peter S Beagle and his The Last Unicorn uh for me was the first really in-depth exploration of theme, right? I don't know mm. if people have have so Peter S. Beagle wrote the screenplay for the movie, uh, which so cleaves very close to the novel. The novel has incredible prose, very delicious prose again, right? But it, it's fairly similar. And in that book, the reason that the bad king is able to control the Red Bull, the Red Bull is is a horrible flaming monster that uh, basically captures all the unicorns, and it's controlled by one man, and the man that one man wants all of the unicorns because he's never happy in his life, and so he wants all the beauty to come to him. The only time he's ever happy is with unicorns. So the, in the Red Bull, the the, the guy, uh, he's able to control the bull because the bull doesn't f- uh, will obey anyone who's not afraid of him, right? And that's that's kind of a really powerful theme, right? That the Red Bull will obey anybody that's not power that's uh, that's that doesn't fear him because bull is very close to the word bully, right? So, you know, what Be- Beagle is basically saying is uh, bullies will kind of cave or follow anybody who doesn't fear them. And that's an incredibly powerful message for what's occasionally a children's children's novel. And it's a very well-disguised theme as well. You have to really analyze it in order to kind of figure out what that's about. So anyways, sorry, um, when we're talking about influences, you can have more than just authors. I just spoke about The Last Unicorn as a particular work that's influenced me. Uh, Moses, has there any? You mentioned, of course, um, Martin and Rothfuss, but has has there been any other work in particular that's really influenced you? Yeah, I've mentioned before that Homer and the Iliad and Greek mythology were just huge personal influences, and my story has ten gods and you know interesting stuff like that. And then I've mentioned before that Robotech was this show that I watched when I was a kid. <clears throat> I can say a little more on that one, which is that uh, I think I've mentioned before that there's 
the way that they treated death, like you had major characters dying, and I, I, it blew me away when I'm like 10 years old, seeing a major character who dies in a realistic way on the show. But I think that, you know, our influences, you know, like, like Jordan, you just talked about bullying, right? And you've mentioned before how you had been bullied and how Ender was bullied, and that's why people can relate to him and stuff like that. You know, with Robotech, it was, you know, you have this kind of military type of scenario. You've got guys who are fighter pilots, basically, um, and one of them is shot is basically shot down, you know, and he, and he dies. And then his his best friend, who's kind of his little brother, he finds out that his big brother, you know, has died. And I think it's it, it's a personal connection for me too, because my father was a Vietnam vet. He didn't he didn't die in, in Vietnam, but he was in you know firefights. And he did he after he came home, he you know he didn't live that many more years after he came home. He probably had problems based on what happened to him in Vietnam. So I, I have this, you know, personal connection to all that because of, you know, of my own history and, you know, this, this sort of military story. And then as I rewatch Robotech with my kid recently, I realized there's kind of this, this element of focusing on the military guys, uh, but yet there, com- there comes this kind of anti-war message at the end of it, too, where, you know, they're trying to figure out how to, how to create peace between all these people. Um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting to look at your influences and think about why did that influence you so much? Like, what was it about that that maybe... Uh, what was it about that that has a connection to you personally and um, that, that's rich stuff you know that's deep stuff that's, that's the stuff that you write about from your soul the stuff you can't help writing about because that, that's you that's what you've got to put on the page you know um, yeah yeah I totally I totally am there with you you know we talked about our literary influences but yeah your life influences they may not be um, you know as, as you know uplifting and warming and all that but uh, um, you know uh, Carrie Smith in fifth through eighth grade, who tormented me nonstop, and you know all her little cohorts uh, have definitely uh, influenced um, well not only the type of person I became, but the type of writing I do. Uh, as far as um, you know, the the underdog uh, becoming a better person and, and getting over stuff like that. Um, you know, the experiences with your family. Uh, and where you look back and go, wow, that, that was kind of a messed up situation. Uh, and you can write about stuff like that. Joshua, has there been any work? Uh, I, guess, I guess it's tough as an editor because you can't say, well, this editor really changed yeah. this work. <laughs> so this was really influential, right? Um, uh, no, I think the best well, way for me to speak about this is you know, how it influenced me as, as a creative person. Sure. I have a question for Josh. Josh, who do you think is influencing the current up-and-coming writers? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, <laughs> obviously, George R.R. R. Martin is there. I see a lot of influence with uh, with that. A lot. Um, who else? I see Scalzi influence, like Jordan was saying. Um, uh, the dialogue, I, th- I see a lot of people uh, trying to emulate the way that he does his dialogue. Who else? Can, can you talk about that? Like, the way he does his dialogue? Like, do you mean kind of like the silly farty kind of stuff, or like you know, like? <laughs> I mean, no, did there's... you just <laughs> described Scalzi's <laughs> dialogue as silly and farty? Yeah, like like old man's war. There's there's a lot of like hilarious dialogue. People talking about like basic bodily stuff, where it's just kind of like lighthearted like that, you know. Well, the thing is, it's real, right? You believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that I think he's been great for authors, not just new authors, um, because I, I see two kinds of dialogue, two major kinds of dialogue in my work. I see the kind of dialogue that you, when you read it, it just you blow through it. Like I love that because the pages just fly because uh, it's completely believable. It's realistic. You understand the characters. You understand who they are and why they're saying what they're saying. And then there's the kind of dialogue that sounds more like. Uh, black and white TV from the 50s or uh, uh, old British TV shows um, it kind of stilted more stiff, very proper you know, people don't talk la- like that uh, as our show amply demonstrates <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, just sort of a freeing up of characters' voices um, I-, I think that people are learning from Scalzi. Okay, yeah because, yeah, I, I laughed out loud, like, so many times at just things his characters would say, you know, and it was just so so simple down to earth and just, you know, 
funny things that people would say that you might not even say in like polite company, but there it is on the page. Well, I did a I did a running thing for a while on uh, on Facebook and Twitter where I would repeat the most amusing thing that I had overheard, you know, that day or, or that week, <laughs> or whatever. And people say the weirdest crap. <laughs> like you just hear these little splices of conversation, and you know, <laughs> people are talking about about like eating possum and about what kind of bowel movements they had that day. I mean, just really weird personal stuff that you wouldn't expect just walking down the street outside my apartment to hear. Uh, That's real. That's what people talk about. That's how they talk. Uh, And again, you know, back to what Scalzi is doing, that's how he writes. Uh, Any other literary influences um, that I can think well okay Robert Jordan obviously because there are a lot of people who are trying to follow that um, epic style of writing wh- where it just you know, the story blows out all over the world with you know tons of characters and stuff like that I'd say Brandon Sanderson as well um, people are starting to trend with his magic systems we kind of touched bases on that in a, a previous show you know what sorry I wanted to talk a little bit about Robert Jordan um, do it you know like people uh, Often I see new writers writing 150,000 word books, right? And and if you're not familiar with the length of a book, um, word count wise, many of our listeners probably are, but it's 90,000 words is about what you want to hit in a first novel. And they're just writing huge, like I, I've seen two or 300,000 word novels. What do you say to uh, it, it com- people who come with the, with size that size book to you? What do you say? What it, you I mean, it, it completely depends on the genre, though. Like in, in epic fantasy, I think like 120 is often more of a number that you shoot for, and then obviously YA is less, and sure, yeah. romance. Is, that's true. Romance is less. I think I don't write romance, but you know, genre. It, it, the genre dictates that. But every tie-in novel that I've a contract that I've you know, God, and it's just been 90,000. You know, like, okay. it's just, that's what you go for. Just, like, they're all about the same size if you go to them on the bookstores. But you're absolutely right in that some some genres, it's more and some it's less. Yeah, yeah. in epic fantasy, for example, Michael J. Sullivan, who was a very popular, successful indie author, now he's with Orbit Books. Like, his his editor, uh, Davey Pillai, has wanted, a, wanted him to be in the epic category. So she's wanted him to write longer, longer stuff. And she actually did a thing where she bundled two of his books together as one book. Well, he had written six books, and when she re-released them, the first two were one book, the next two were one book, and the next two were one book, because she wanted it to be bigger, because the epic readers wanted that fat thing. So, you know, my, a- bo- my book that I'm writing now is about 150,000, which is, you know, if it were picked up by a publisher, that might not even be long enough for them if they want to make it into an epic-type series. The important thing to realize, and that not too many people realize, is that very few people get picked up uh, to do uh, an epic fantasy series with with no credits, right? Just out of the slush pile. It's just, mm-hmm. it's incredibly rare. Robert Jordan wrote a lot of Conan, right? Which I guess you can call a tie-in. Yeah, we, oh, tie-in. Robert Jordan sure. is one of us. Yay! Um, <laughs> you know, but he did have a lot of experience and he had publishing contacts, right? Before, so he could attract notice, right? I I would argue that it's exceptionally difficult. Uh, to get those epic fantasy series w- with nothing under your belt, right? And you can go to the bookstore, and you can s- check out the size of the volumes, right? Th- uh, those epic fantasy series, they sell well, but there's not a huge number of them. Uh, <laughs> Diana, I, I, I'm, I'm I, can, just, I can hear I, you bouncing in your seat. <laughs> no, I, I, I want to I disagree first. Can I do that? Go for um, it. No, because that that is the thing in epic fantasy. I mean, a lot of times you write a standalone with series potential, and you can pitch it that way. But generally, they if it's good, they are looking for a series, and they are looking for bigger books than the average book. And I, I do think you see a lot of people who get picked up that way who don't get picked up, in fact, unless they're writing a big series. I think that is a thing in epic fantasy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess we're going to have to agree to disagree and maybe go off, and I'll do a little bit more research. But uh, many of the epic fantasy authors that I can think of have some history doing some Patrick, other Patrick Rothfuss, I mean, he about the only credit he had before that was Writers of the Future. Yeah. But he basically uh, had no real publishing credits before then. But the Writers of the Future, that, that's a very special story, right? Because that's a very... Uh, first but of I'm all, saying, Kevin J. Anderson's backing, who has uh, 23 million books in print. Right, but I'm saying he didn't have a whole bunch of other books he'd written before. This was his you know, his first novel, but it was a really, really good one. But that's so. true, but but he did it and managed to attract attention. Like, he got turned down from everywhere, right? Like, he, he had submitted all over the place and gotten turned down until he won Writers of the Future. And he says this in the introduction of that book, Name of the Wind. 
um, where Kevin, um, based on the strength of that excerpt from his novel, uh, Kevin's agent agreed to represent him, right? And so... No, uh, so Matt Bialis was agent. We had the same agent. Sorry. No, Kevin, Kevin might have introduced him to uh, Matt. Yes. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, for, cl- yeah. Yeah, thank you yeah. for clarifying that. In, in, in any case, you know, basically... Pat, Pat, I don't think is a good example of somebody that that had no experience because he did have the right as the future went. And well, he I think the there's backing a, of power. well, there's a reason for that. I mean, if a, if a publisher is going to invest in a big long series, they want to know that you have the chops to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. They want to know that you don't just have one book that you can actually write. You know, these four or five books that are needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, they're taking a, a really big risk. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I yeah. Again, again, just to completely disagree with you for once, Jordan. Like, <laughs> no, no, like, this is good. I, I, Conflict is good. Yeah, like I, I don't like. I would have a hard time thinking of like new on the scene fantasy, epic fantasy writers who just write a standalone. Like, it's usually a series. Like, a publisher will usually publish a new guy as a series. However, you get their attention. There's different ways to get their attention. Um, it's yeah, it's not that easy to get picked out of the slush pile. But maybe you get an agent, and then they sell the book for you. Or maybe you do get picked up out of the slush pile. I mean, it, it happens, uh, and it's. Often, you know, you write the thing as a, as a standalone with series potential. Some people do just come in with the series, because especially in Epic Fantasy, that's what it is. But I can think of, like, every name that I can think of in Epic Fantasy, they all come in out of nowhere with, with series. And they've done something to get attention, granted. But it's always, you almost always start with series in that genre. Because that's what sells in that genre. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah, I feel you. I'm just saying, like, they, they, usually they've done something else. Like, Robert Jordan had done that and was... I think dating or married to a senior tour editor or something, right? You know, like I mean, yeah. So, so, yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree. They're looking for series. Look at it this way. Um, I guess I'm still coming from a traditional standpoint, right? Just because I mean, it seems like that's the market that we're talking about selling to. If if you're an indie writer, you can just put it up yourself, right? But mm-hmm. with a traditional author, those books are large, right? And by definition, they're going to be more expensive, right? Right. They're they're, they're going to be more expensive to produce. But they'll also be more expensive to buy, right? So yes, it's 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 difficult to attract a new writer, a, a reader to a new writer, unless there's a price differential, right? And um, the publishing company is taking far more risk. First right. of all, that you won't finish that series, right? You know, like maybe you'll peter out, like like Josh was was saying, right? Or you know, like maybe it turns out to be bad, or you don't get an audience for whatever reason, right? It's a, it's a way more of a risk. I'm just saying it's 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 vastly yeah. more difficult. Actually, Pat Ross is maybe a perfect example because he did try to pitch his book for a long time and his book was huge. Like his first book, I'm sure it was even bigger than, I forget what it was initially, but we're talking like three or four hundred thousand or something huge. It was enormous. Yeah. And for a long time, he couldn't get a publisher interested in it because it was too big. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was super big. <laughs> that was really big. Yeah. You know? Whereas, like in, in epic fantasy, I, I would think you know 120,000. I've heard is often a number that you shoot for for your first book, but maybe a little bigger, maybe 150. I think once once you get in again, like Michael Sul- J. Sullivan has told me, like I think uh, they wanted him like more like 175 to 200,000 for a book or something like that. So, but yeah, initially, if your book is too big, yeah, that is that is a strike against you for all those reasons that you're saying. It's expensive for the publisher to take on a gigantic book. Yeah, I, I agree, uh, and a lot of times I get. Uh, I prefer I love to see books that are between 65 and around 80,000 words. I love that. I feel that that's a sweet spot. But I more often than not get books that are much larger than that. And uh I, I end up doing a lot of epic books. Um sometimes I get these books that are 200,000 words, you know, 900 pages, and often the advice that I will give these these new authors cuz almost all of them who have almost all of them who've given me these really long books are new authors. Uh, I suggest that maybe they might want to break their books up, uh, see if there's a good and natural place in the story somewhere where they can find a split. And then there are a lot of advantages to doing that. And Moses, after I um, say this, I'd love to have your thoughts. Um, I will uh, suggest that uh, the more product that they have on the market, uh, the better visibility they have. Every uh, book that they have out there will, is like a billboard for themselves and for every other book that they have. So if they take this 900 page uh, monster and they make three books out of it, I mean, that increases their visibility. Um, if they're going with traditional publishing, they might find it a lot easier to sell a trilogy of 80,000 words each rather than a single 200,000 uh, K book, also. But if you stick with that indie route, um, It'll help also increase uh, buyer confidence in you, right? The more books that you have out there, the more likely people are to buy one of your books, 
and there's a couple reasons for that. First, it assures them that you've been a writer for a while, you work, you you have output, and you'll keep working and having output. So that there's something for them to go back to. Like if they try your book, they actually spend money on you. They know that they can immediately have satisfaction and go get your next book. Um, Sorry, that's and then hopefully buy it by the rest of your books too. And hopefully right by the rest of your books. Exactly. They don't have to wait for the second or the third book. They can just go in, bam, binge reading. Um, and all your series, everything. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then of course, the more books that you have out there, the more money you'll make. And uh, enormous books tend, uh, at least this has been the trend in the past, that they tend not to do as well as the shorter books, shorter books in uh, indie and traditional markets, I believe. Yeah, there's such a thing as an or- orphaned book as well. We've gotten really off topic, so I want us to get back onto influences. I'm just going to very briefly say there's such a thing as an orphan book, which is when you just have one book in the shelf at, at Chapters or Barnes & Noble or something, it gets lost in amongst other, you know, uh, authors that have many books, right? Your your one little book doesn't get very high visibility. Um, but Diana, uh, earlier you were talking about um, your experiences being bullied in uh, younger grades. Um, do you feel, you, you said that you'd work some of that into your own novel. Do you feel like this might influence future writers? or? Well, I would hope so. I mean, you know, that's... You know, when I, when I write about a character who, okay, Angel uh, is, is a good example. I mean, I never had the drug addiction or anything like that, but uh, uh, she had a really hard time. And writing about a character that does overcome issues and, and does, you know, do well and, and find um, a good life for herself, I, you know, I do hope that that influences and inspires other people, uh, whether it's influencing them as a reader or a writer. Okay, fair enough. Do, is there anything else that you feel like you might be putting in your books that might influence kind of future generations? Are, are you? Do you set out to influence people? Do you think, well, this is going to be a groundbreaking no, book that's going to no. influence? <laughs> no. Have you read my books? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I have uh, no illusions uh, about my books. I, I am very proud of them, um, um, but they're they're entertaining. Uh, and, the zombie book, the, the first uh, white dress zombie book, I'm most proud of because it is a, a about um, a young woman finding herself and all that. Uh, but uh, you know, it's about a, a chick who works in a morgue and eats brains. So, <laughs> but it's a coming of age story so. <laughs> for the end. Moses, do you feel like there's anything in your book that you hope uh, might influence future writers? Your books, sorry. Um, I mean, I, I think when it comes to influence, I. Some people, you know, might write to try to influence or inspire. Some, some don't, and it's it's not a good or bad thing. It's just why you write. You know, maybe you write to make money. Maybe you write to entertain. Maybe you write to entertain yourself. Uh, I guess I am one of these people who I would ideally like to entertain people while inspiring or influencing in some way. You know, having some sort of like impact on them. You know, stirring something up in them. To, you know, to inspire them to do their own thing or or to think about something deeper too. Like I am one of these writers who likes to write to a theme a little bit. And I like to have a deeper element to the stories that I write. So um, I think if you do want to do that, I mean, I don't know. You probably have to just, you know, you have to try to break out of the mold a little bit and try to do something that's a little unique. And that's where you run into some some risk as a writer because the more you, you deviate from what readers already expect, the less familiar it is and then it's, it's, it's harder. But yet that's the things that really are Great. I mean, we talked about George Martin. You know, he, one of the reasons he was so successful is he came into this fantasy genre when everything was like, you know, the, the White Knight and the Dark Lord kind of stuff. And he's and he just throws the kid out of the tower, you know, and and it's <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the reason why his series grabbed everyone because he said, you know what, I'm going to do something a little different, and it, and it was a reaction to the way fantasy was, I think, at the time. Yeah, so George Martin has has obviously influenced a lot of people. He's influenced me, as I just mentioned, and Joshua's clients. And it's because he w- he dared to do his thing. You know, he dared to do something that was against the norm. And he said, "I'm going to do this, and we'll see if there's a resonance out there for it." You know, and there was. And so, you know, I try to lace some some deeper stuff uh, into my stories. You know, some stuff that. I would say is sort of spiritual, not religious, but kind of like there's a little bit of that in there. And, um, you know, that's just me being me. That's just me saying, if I'm going to write a book, I don't want to do it just like everyone else has always done it. I want to try to add something that's a little bit different and see if, see if it uh, resonates with readers. 
Great. I think Jack. we missed out a, gr- a really big influence when I was talking about different writers. J.K. Rowling is another huge influencer, and same with uh, uh, Stephanie Myers. Definitely. I mm-hmm. see a lot. Um, of course, more from my, my female clients than my male clients, but definitely a lot of that in there. Sure. Uh, as an editor, I mean, you, you work with a lot of, you said that you get a lot of epic fantasy in and you get a lot of certain kinds of books. Do you feel like through your editing, you're influencing like a large number of literary works? Or I've actually thought about that a lot um, in the last year because every editor has their own particular style and their own particular quirks and uh, pet peeves and so forth and I know I've got my own and I've started very clearly marking those because I don't want people to be fooled into thinking that an edit comment that I make is grammatical when really it's stylistic um, so yeah I've been wondering that a lot lately whether or not the way that I edit especially for new writers is going to affect their voice and their style and if that in uh, in the future uh, they can look back and go oh you know I wouldn't have written that way if it weren't for that series of comments that, that Joshua made on some of my earlier books. And then I wonder, uh, would they go, <laughs> oh, I wish he hadn't said that, the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so briefly, um, you know, with my own work, I, I am very theme-focused. What I try to do is work through issues that I have in my own life, often surrounding death, which we'll get into in our next show, um, which is, you know, writing your dark side. Um but yeah, I, I like Moses. I try to write to a theme. You know, I try to have, I try to examine some topic that bothers me in my life through fiction. Um, and the reason I like fantasy and science fiction is because uh, you can have characters represent abstract concepts very easily uh, in, in those genres. Uh, in any case, here we go into our closing thoughts. Uh, we're going to keep them fairly brief. Uh, Diana, um, I just wanted to say that you know when you're looking at your literary influences. It- be willing to go outside your genre. Even if you write fantasy or science fiction, uh, read mysteries, read romance, because there's they have a lot to offer. Uh, there is mystery and romance in all of the science fiction fantasy as well. Uh, and so you learn a lot by, by stretching, uh, stretching a bit and reading other stuff. Very good point. Uh, Moses? Uh, my other biggest influences are Jordan Ellinger, Josh, <laughs> Joshua Esso, uh, Diana Rowland and Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> I was That's said in the weird. same sentence as the Beliebs. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, closing thoughts. Okay. Um, why Star Wars will always be infinitely better than Star Trek, <laughs> even though as an adult I think Star Trek has edged ahead, is because Star Wars was there when I was a kid. I had the toys. I had all the movies, and it touched upon my childhood brain and my imagination like no other science fiction will ever again be able to. So find that thing that influences you because of the emotional core that it strikes within you personally, and then use that and write. It comes back again to um, writing not only what you know, but what you love. So Joshua, I'm going to come to your house and fight you about that Star Trek versus Star Wars. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. So, Star Star Trek... Not the J.J. Abrams, but before the original series was was, was so much better for so many reasons. But <laughs> it, 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 we, we should have a show about this in, at some point in the future. In any case, uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode of Hide and Create. We look forward to seeing you next week. This has been another episode of Hide and Create. The show is produced by me, Jordan Ellinger. The site is edited by Joshua Esso. And your co-hosts have been Diana Rowland and Moses Sergar. That music that you're listening to was written by Jason Donnelly. We can be reached at writingpodcastonline.com, where you can ask us questions and suggest topics for future shows. Thank you for listening. Now go hide and create something.